Hello. Hi, is this Lou? Yes, it is. All right. Yes, it is. Let me do the official introduction, ladies and gentlemen. We are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. He is a songwriter, a singer, a producer, a podcast host, and a legendary musician. We are so excited to welcome the one and only Lou Christie to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome, Lou. Well, thank you very much. Boy, that's an introduction, isn't it? <laughs> in, the, in the middle of our storm, we're having a storm in New York City right now. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting here listening to it uh, uh, through my skylights. I have some skylights. And it's something down on it. And this is the second time today with lightning and thunder Ugh. and rain. I mean, it's unbelievable. You called it a perfect time. <laughs> well, you, you know, you should be right at home, Lou, because your, your biggest hit was I lightning am. strikes. <laughs> uh, just start singing I, lightning strikes. It doesn't bother me one bit. I, I'm so used to it wow. <laughs> at this point in my life. I'm a big fan. I've got all your original vinyl albums. Just, just love oh, your music. Wow. And and we were talking about because one of the things that I really like about you because you know that was quite popular back then but you don't see it so much anymore and that is the falsetto voice. Uh, I guess there was a story about how you decided to start doing that. Well, uh, the story was that I was gonna I had a chance to cut a record, <clears throat> and uh, they said, "Well, you know, listen, kid." You know, they talked in those terms back there <laughs> in those days. And they said, listen, kid, you know, you know, they've, they've, they've got 250 or 300 records come out, uh, 45s, you know, and if the disc jockey puts that needle on that record and uh, it doesn't turn him on in 15 seconds, he'll, he'll you know, that'll, that's the end of it. He that's won't, right. You know, so I thought, I've got to get their attention. Yeah. Uh, so I said, I've got five seconds to do that. So I said, I have some trouble with my baby. <laughs> you know, with the court. And I started singing Paul Sarah. I said, I'll, at this point, I might as well, you know, i got to go for it. And and that's the way I wrote the song. And that's the way it happened. And, that's, and all of a sudden, people said, who is this? What is this? <laughs> you know, is it a guy? Is it a girl? Is it a, you know, is he black? Is he white? Or she? Or what is it? You know. Or, or is he Frankie Valley? Because they... <laughs> All right, please. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, let's not let's not go there. <laughs> Do you no, ever... as a matter of fact go Frankie ahead. and I really re- recorded almost parallel yeah. to each other. I didn't know Frankie of course and he didn't know who the hell I was, you yeah. know. I was from Pittsburgh, he was Jersey and he had a group and I had a group and after we I never you know, I brought my first record out with uh, Luigi and the Lions, which I'm Luigi, they call that instead of Luigi, you know, mm-hmm. it's like a short version of a street name for Luigi, or Lu- Lu- Luigi Alfredo Giovanni Sacco. We didn't be able to, we weren't able to put that on a record. Uh, <laughs> so it became Luigi and the Lions, and uh, and I re- did a record probably 19, maybe 60, uh, 59, I was 59, 60, I was doing... Uh, you know, some, a few backgrounds, and then I had my first record, which was by Luigi and the Lions, called The Jewelry. And then I graduated into Lou Christie, you yeah. know. Uh, but that was, uh, Frankie and I literally almost, I think we run parallel, you know, month by month. But I didn't know him until I had the gypsy cried out, and he had Sherry uh, yeah. out, you know. Right. So it was very, very strange. And then the first show we did, together was at the Cow Palace in San Francisco uh, 1962 maybe 60 I think maybe 62 uh, but not of course we know each other now quite well we even toured together for a while well of course all the hits kind of validated your decision but at any point did, did you ever regret or have second thoughts about doing a falsetto because you know I can imagine that people like you and Frankie Valley are saying Oh God, I've got to do the falsetto, and I'm 65 or I'm 70 years old now, and your voice lowers when you get older. Well, uh, uh, you know what? I, you know, I put that stamp on myself. I yeah. take responsibility for it, <laughs> and that was my first million-selling record, the first song I ever wrote with Twyla. 
Yeah. And she and I wrote the Gypsy Cried in 15 minutes. And I thought, wow, we better follow it up. And that was Two Faces Have I. Right. You know, another million sellers. So I was on a road to success, and I wasn't about to change it. Yeah. I mean, I would have liked to have sung, like, you know, Perry Como or Dean Martin or something in my lower register. Yeah. But uh, but I, uh, it was rock and roll at that time. And I I had to, um, you know, come up with my own sound. And, right. I, and I did, you know. For sure. And, uh, you know, there are days when I think, oh, my God, I'm still singing in this key. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm still singing in this, you know. And, uh, but, you know, I, 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 the fun of performing is when you get out on the stage and you'll be able to sing some other songs. And I right. have this range of octaves, you know, three or four octaves or whatever. And I get to use my whole voice all the time. You know, I've right. always, I do a lot in my lower voice. And then I move up into my high. Boy, you know, and uh, do do songs uh, with the hit records, you know, because you gotta you gotta sing those hits every time you walk out on the stage. And you know? you, you still got it, man. You really definitely still got it. That's that's for sure. Now, what was the dish? How was the decision made? I mean, that that this was what you wanted to do? Because I had read, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you had been given a couple of classical music scholarships as well, and and you kind of decided yeah. to go into the vein of rock and roll, right? Absolutely. Well, I used to run home and watch American Bandstand there you go. After, <laughs> after chorus practice, you know, because uh, I, I was like student conductor, and I sang all the, all the um, you know, the, the solos and things like that. But, you know, I was caught up in the commercialism of, you know, American Bandstand, and oh my God, and, and you know, and Fabian was on there, and Bobby Rydell, and Annette Bonicello, and I thought oh, I got to get into this ball game, and that, and I was I was raised on a farm, you know, an old uh, a little farm outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, about thirty five miles outside of there, out in the country, you know. Uh, that, I'm really a farm kid, you know. Uh, we had chickens and goats and pigs and uh, uh, ducks and pigeons and you know that that was mm -hmm. our life you know and da daisy june our one cow that we had a little baby <laughs> cow <laughs> well you know a lot my, of the... that was my... go ahead i just said that was my life as, uh. as uh, growing up as a kid you know my father was italian and he was old sort of old world italian you want something go do it and shut up and just do it there work and do it <laughs> And that was it, you know. <laughs> a lot of the singers were uh, afraid of the British invasion, and of course you had to face that too. But I can imagine a lot of them were afraid of the, the Philly invasion. There were so many people. I, I talked to Bobby Rydell and a few others about this, about what was it about that area that, that turned around and turned out such great uh, singers. He told me it, it was the uh, the sandwiches, you know, with the cheese and the beef and everything. <laughs> so I don't know what it was. but Well, they listened to us. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> they, were to, they were listening to America when they were making their plans of wanting to be a, like an American singer. Yeah, uh, they listened to Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, uh, you know Jerry Lee Lewis. Oh, lightning just struck right across. <laughs> I'm just walking out the window right now. Isn't that weird? But anyhow, uh, but that's what you know. They listened to the people in America. That's why they, you know, when they came to America. I mean. You know, they did a Marvelette song. They did a, this song. Of this. You know, they, they wanted to be American pop stars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And guess what? They became it. You know, they came worldwide, you know. But we were already out there doing our thing, you know, like like Bobby or Frankie Avalon or, you know, um, or Del Shannon and right. uh, all of us. We were out there working the circuits already for a couple of years before they came to America. Yeah. Um, um, and uh, they did, you know, they did it, and, uh, and the it was time for a change. You know, they were unique. I mean, they dressed differently, and their hair was the whole thing, and life, life changed, you know. Yeah. And we were, and a lot of people just fell by the wayside. But I, I had a, I mean, I really broke out more even when the Beatles were here, because at one point, I think most of the people thought I was English, because that uh, gypsy cried broke through with the two faces of I. Then lightning was in the middle of all this, you know, this, um, I guess it was the sexual revolution yeah. thing and the, and the protests in the Vietnam. And there I am with lightning strikes and I'm going to make you mine. 
and I just rode all through the 60s, and I was performing with The Who. Right. I was performing with, you know, uh, you know uh, Dave Clark Five, uh, you know, Dusty Springfield, all the people from England. I was, and I was going over there and did like, you know, uh, the, the TV shows over there, Ready, Steady, Go, and uh, 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 and so I, I, a lot of people thought that I was English. Yeah, I think I did too for a while. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because it's just I, a thing. Uh, well, first of all, yeah, and my hair got a little longer, <laughs> and I was buying <laughs> a lot of clothes from Carnaby Street, and I was spending a lot of time in Europe because the records were taken off over there, and most of my friends here, which was kind of weird, uh, you know, I mean, the little magazine, one of the fan magazine, Teen Life or something like that, wrote an article about how the, how all of my friends were just, you know, the Beatles ruined them, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and they were all the people that I was sitting on the bus with on Dick Clark's <laughs> American Bandstand Tour, yeah. you know, because with a caravan of stars, we yeah. traveled around and did, you know, 32 one-nighters in a row, you yeah. know. I guess well, one yeah, you're on. And mentioning that, because you had said that kind of the reason you wanted to go into rock and roll was you were all wrapped up into the American Bandstand thing. That was kind of a destiny fulfilled, because you did end up on Dick Clark's Cavalcade of Stars. What was it like going on those tours? I mean, you guys were, you know, all crammed in a bus for quite a long time. Was it fun? Was it grueling? Was it, what was it like? I guess your bus mate was Diana Ross a lot, right? Yeah. Yes, it was. That's yeah. why it was fun for me. There you go. There you <laughs> because, go. Because I, I looked at her at one point on television when she was just had, I guess, where'd our love go? And I remember calling my sister uh, Amy, who did a lot of my early records with me, the yeah yeahs in the background and all those Gypsy Cried things and records. And my friend, I said, I just saw this girl, and. She's going to be such a big star. I just have this feeling about her. And then I was booked on a 30-some-day tour with Diane, with the girl, with mm -hmm. Supreme. And um, and uh, she was, uh, well, I told Brian Hyde, and I said, don't get near her, Brian. She she was my bus buddy on the bus. We sat together on the, on the tour. Uh, and uh, and her mom was uh, two, two doors behind, or, or two doors two seats behind mm -hmm. us because she was chaperoned they you know they had sure. to chaperone the girls and a lot of the people were had had to have chaperones we were underage mm -hmm. uh of course i didn't but i had a chance to sit with her every day every night and sleep with her on the bus because uh and we i just knew that this girl was going to be the next biggest star and she just had a magic that i just i just knew it Mm -hmm. I just took, and we talked and we played records and you know and you know I did all those things that kids do on the bus right. and I was smitten by her that's all I could say mm -hmm. and I said I know this girl and we we kept in touch for many years and uh, I'm waiting to probably bump into her again soon hopefully yeah. <laughs> but uh, we really um, we, you know I did I was at their openings at the Copacabana and we, I saw her just you know, gravitate to that spotlight, and it just, she walked into the spotlight better than anyone I've ever seen. Yeah. And um, she, I knew she was going to, she was going to do it, you know, she was going to do it. And that was in the beginning when I don't even think Barry Gordy knew she was going to do it. Yeah. Uh, but she had this something that was, I said, I don't know, she looks Egyptian or something, her lips, her mouth, or her eyes, or what, what the hell's going on with her? But she had something that was so alluring, and she pulled you into her. So, you know, when you see her on some of the old stuff, you could see why she just... For sure. She had to step out in the spotlight. Well, you know, I, I guess on, I think it was, uh, on the bus that... Uh, Dick Clark was on the bus with you guys. You would think that being who he was, that maybe he would you know, isolate himself from that, but he was just like one of the kids, right? He was literally, uh, Dick was a uh, caddy corner from me and Diana uh, on the bus. He, he slept on the bus with us every other night, same thing, and we'd get a hotel room every, every other night also. But we would travel, you know, at night uh, after the show concert and dick was right there with us in the early days he, wow. he traveled with us 
and then we had, you know, then we split off and did a couple other. There were two two buses going out, so he would fly in and out to try to, you know, to satisfy everyone's needs, you know, because he was also flying to uh, L.A. at the time to do uh, band, uh, right. American Band yeah. mm-hmm. and he would like, uh, you know, film like four of them a day, uh, a day or five of them, you know, for the week, and then come back out on the road. Well, I've heard uh, legendary us. stories about his sense of humor. You sent us a photo. He's got like a broom or something, and, and you guys are clowning around. Was there was there a story behind <laughs> that photo, or was it just publicity? Or oh, what? Well, it was you know Dick. He was he was just uh, he was just a gentleman. He was very easy to be around. He was a businessman, and we you know none of us talked business. It was all about you know. I mean, we never, we didn't do that. There were no rules about this. You didn't do that as an mm-hmm. artist. You know, you had a manager or an agent who took care of all that stuff. And but Dick was just um, so easy. I and mean, you know, would go and eat, you know, eat Chinese restaurant. But I'll tell you, his jaw tightened up when we would head in the south. Mm. Mm. And and that that stopped all the bullshit at that yeah, point yeah. Uh, because uh, uh, it, there wasn't any it was the, all of us go on stage tonight if there is a problem the show does not go on yeah. Right. I don't care what color you are how you know whatever you are what, whatever the show is the show and thank you and we'll see you at the end of the show that yeah. was it I, and, I that, and that's the way it worked I imagine we, he did have trouble like like uh, you know, a lot of the early uh, people, you know, uh, as far as segregation and, and prejudice, especially when he went to the South, that's for sure. We all had it. Yeah. We were on the Freedom Bus when we went to Mississippi, when we went South to Alabama, when we were in New Orleans, when we were in Savannah, Georgia. That was, that was the problem. We got to the South. We weren't allowed to go to restaurants. Wow. Mm-hmm. To eat, all of us. So if you saw the green book or the green, whatever it was called, the green, we all we all lived through that. Yeah. We had stones that were thrown at the bus. We had people taking the bus because you know the, the show was the Drifters, the Crystals, uh, you know the Supremes, me, Brian Hyland, uh, you know Gene Pitney, uh, Johnny Tillerson. So it was this was this was who we were. This was rock and roll. We yeah. made records and I. I did not believe what was going on because I was raised out in the country. Like I said, I did not understand what was going on. I, yeah. That was that. How, that's how vulnerable I was, or stupid, um, because I, I I didn't watch the news like you do today. I didn't know really what was going on. You know, I, I it's it, when you would see a sign that said colored or white or something to, uh, at, at a at a water fountain or something. I didn't know what they were talking about. Okay. I was that, that, that vulnerable. I really was. And, but it didn't mean anything to me because I don't know what they were talking about. Yeah, yeah, for but sure. But found out, we found out the farther we would travel in the South, and once we would get out of the South, we would, you would lighten up. But we had terrible times in Baltimore, Maryland, in Savannah, Georgia, in Greensburg, North Carolina. It was. It was not. It was not. It was not fun. I mean, we. I didn't even look at it as not fun. But I was there with all the people that I, I dreamt about and thought about. Oh my God! I'm going to be on the Dick Clark Caravan of Stars. I just bought their record three months ago. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I'm sitting next to someone who was like. Oh my gosh! It, you know, it's going to take off and be the number one star in the, in the world. <laughs> you know, and uh, it was just magnificent for me. I was never, I wasn't tired. I mean, it was tiring, but, you know, I mean, uh, at that point, I, I being Italian, I already had a, 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 a grow a, a, my beard. <laughs> and we would put pancake makeup on. We'd have to go on stage. We'd have a matinee. If we had a matinee, you just, you know, you dress sometimes, you, you know, uh, in, in the locker room or something at some school or something, and and I don't know how, why I don't look wrinkled because I don't know how to travel. <laughs> I used to wear suits and I thought they didn't wrinkle like they did. It, is, it, isn't just, it isn't just African Americans when they say black don't crack because it doesn't crack on Italians either. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Well, 
Oh, no, I mean, but you know, you just you go on stage, and we get back on that bus, you know, with pancake makeup on, and you know, and change back into your Levi's, or you know, and get on the bus, and then you hit the hit the maybe in the morning, seven or eight o'clock in the morning, uh, the next uh, hotel would stay in, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. But it was it was exciting, but you know, you're when you're nineteen, seventeen, eighteen years oh, old, yeah. twenty years old, you know, it's like. What are you complaining about? You right. Know, I have a, I have a top ten record. What am I complaining about? I'm sitting with, you know, with Del Shannon and and the Supremes and Mary Wilson and uh, the Crystals and Gene Pitney and Brian Hyland and you know, I mean, what 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 better could it be? You know. <laughs> uh, speaking of in the top ten. Speaking of Del Shannon, another one with a great falsetto voice. I got to know him a little bit. Such a great oh, guy and, and such a great tragedy. What do you think it is that that some people in your biz can handle it, and and then some people fall into depression like Dell did? Well, I think that 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 I don't you I don't know if I can you can't blame it necessarily. You know, it's it's reasons why he got into the business. You know, you go back to your childhood, and you 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 sort of sort out things, or you grow with it or you don't or you you know he had some love affair problems yeah. uh you know and you don't you don't know what's in the other person's mind but i love dale he oh, was God, one of my great. favorite people yeah and he had a great twisted sense of humor <laughs> <laughs> uh, and i i just lo- i just thought he was great I, I, all these people are they're like my graduating class you know i mean these are people that i've known more than my own family, you know, because I've lived with them and seen them more. You know, it's Bobby Rydell and Frankie Avalon and Fabian and uh, just all, you know, everyone. Dell was yeah, absolutely one of them. And uh, just, it was just, they're just magnificent people that, you know, that we live, uh, I guess, in a, I don't know, a rarefied air that we sort of all breathe together when we're to get, you know, when we're out there because we live, um, a different kind of life than the average person and I keep trying to I guess you know I always have to remember where you're from who you are absolutely uh, and, and you're really you're really no different than anyone else in the world except the attention is on you mm-hmm. and you know you and I mean and there were times I thought oh you know there's a lot of artists that think I have to get on that stage one more time I have to do it you know I have to you know, and and you sort of learn, you know, especially with this pandemic thing that happened. You know, you sort out your life and you say, what 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 was important now? Yeah. yeah. You know what what happened before I had my number one record, or what happened before I was in teen magazines or whatever. You know, you have to. I go back to my family or the farm, you know, and I I'm still like my chickens and my love cats and <laughs> animals, you know. I'm I'm really pathetic when it comes to that. I'm just a, um, I, I, you know, a kid that was raised with an Italian father and a Polish mother. Yeah. Right. My mother was Polish and very beautiful. Uh, well, and part she of, the one. Part sorry, of your family, sorry. you know, just like if you talk to Elton John, you got to talk about Bernie Taupin, and you talk to Meatloaf, you got to talk about Jim Steinman, and we want to talk about Twyla because she was very important to your career. Twyla. Well, <laughs> Twyla was, yes, yeah, she was a walking acid grip, if I can put it that way. Yeah. She was so, I, well, that could be the second book that I'm writing. I don't know, because <laughs> I can't put it all in one book. Right. Uh, she was, I was 15 when I met her. She was, I think, a 30, maybe 37 at that point or something like that. And she, yeah. She didn't know a thing about rock and roll, and she was a classical pianist. She could, she could memorize. She was like Chopin for like a hundred pages that she did her whole life. This is what she played classic, and she didn't know a thing about rock and roll. And I surely didn't know anything about playing a piano, classical piano. Uh, but she studied her whole life and uh, was a a. And she only trusted me. It was really weird. Wow. Uh, we never ha- we never had a fight. We never argued, and we laughed 
constantly. She had an incredible sense of humor and saw through things. Um, she just saw through the nonsense of many things in life, uh, what people worried about. You know, she was. And when we connected and we wrote that Gypsy Cried in 15 minutes, there was no stopping us. Some of the most uh, wonderful things that I wrote and that we talked about, the way we wrote, the way we wrote together, because we would start talking, uh, you know, with a cup of sank or a cup of coffee, and, you know, and then, and then uh, we would smoke Carlton cigarettes together. Mm -hmm. uh, we the kind, remember, you used to have holes in the filters? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we <smoked laughs> and we would talk and we would talk, and she had such an awareness I was 15 years old what awareness that I have you know feeding the chickens I don't know I'm, I'm making pizza because my father had a pizza house too so <laughs> of course I, you know, does it all tell you family you know. <laughs> but, but she she had a uh, and she had two two girls two daughters from her first marriage uh and Shirley, her one daughter, sang on my records, the first couple of records with me. Wow. Gypsy Cried, Two Faces of I, and the whole first album. Shirley was on that, and my sister sang, and then Kay, one of their best friends. So it was all this sort of incestual thing that was like, I don't know what, I, I can't explain what it was, and we laughed, and we just had our own way of visualizing the world. And some of the things that I wrote, I, I'm, I'm just writing now because I've been doing some writing for some different things, mm -hmm. and uh, and and I can't I can't imagine that I thought some of these words up or some of these things about life, you know, psychology and philosophical things, and you know, I wrote like uh, back to the days of the Romans. I mean, I was probably I don't know, 22 when I wrote that. Uh, just a lot of things that, of such awareness and I think because of her being older and being sort of geniusy I don't want to use that overrated phrase you know they I mean it's over, you know, overrated with Stevie Wonder way back in that period you know but I think um, it, I, it was just something that she and I had some connection on some level and I don't know why but we we just made some incredible music, which you haven't even heard. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, some of the best stuff is in in boxes that I have, or mm -hmm. trunks, or you know, uh, I still have those old cassettes that we used to write on. You know, with, with uh, it, it would probably never be heard. You oh, know, that's too like, bad. Making like a great yeah. anthology box set, jeez. Oh, please! It goes on and on. I, I just, I just, I just have a song. Um, right now that I'm going to I'm going to I just have I, I heard it and I put it on the cassette I, I've got to just get it pressed up for myself to listen to and there's a couple people you know uh, and I and I I'm going to maybe do it in my in my concerts now you know or just do the first verse and say you know maybe the next time I'm here I'll do the next verse uh, mm -hmm. but there, we we really we had a um, a vast um, knowledge of music or passion. I mean, I was like, I loved um, melodies. I loved harmony. See, I was raised with like the McGuire sisters, sure. Les Paul and Mary Ford. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, nothing was, I just, they were just great. My dad was Italian. He played guitar, four chords, the same damn four chords you played the day he died. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and every song he could sing every Italian song on top of it. My father had perfect pitch. My mother had perfect pitch. The whole family sang. The whole family. I thought everyone could sing. <laughs> I never thought that other people could sing, couldn't sing. I never realized it. And until I got much older and they said, oh, I said, well, my, my mother sang like Peggy Lee. Mm -hmm. She had perfect pitch. She's the one who turned me on to Peggy Lee with um, Manana. It was a, a big, you know, a 78 record. You know, she collected. Uh, and she had that. My, she sang as good as Peggy Lee. My dad sang as good as anyone. Perry Como, you, know, you name it. Yeah. He just had a natural voice. And so did my mother. But all of our, my sister did, all of us in the family did. And I thought, I thought everyone sang. And I, 
and I, I, it was, I was amazed when they said, you mean your mother sings, sings too? And your dad? I said, yeah, and my sister, she did the records with me. And what we sang, you know, I, I did the dishes and she washed and she, I dried or something, you know, and we sang and, and she would do the harmony part and then I would, would switch off and, you know, and, and mom would sing and would, you know, we just sang all the time. Music right. was just in our family. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, the, the album, the release Rhapsody in the Rain, because... And knowing that you did, you were working, you know, writing with Twyla, and it's a very interesting dynamic because she was about 20 years your elder, and you just talked about how that kind of changed. You had a much different view than, you know, maybe in the beginning, like a 15-year-old would have. Later on, you ran into issues with people wanting to censor your lyrics, right? Tell us a little bit about what happened there. Well, that's... Start, uh, really happened with lightning because they thought, oh my god, what's this the windshield wipers seem to say? <laughs> you know, together. Well, that was Rhapsody, together. We got banned, you know, because it was, the, it was the, the rhythm of the windshield wipers. They were in the backseat of the car making out. Uh, and the word making out meant something to a kid who was going to school. You know, oh my God, I was making out with this girl, <laughs> right. and it could have been it could have been kissing to anything else, you know. No. And 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 I, and I and I said the windshield wipers seem to say together, 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 you know, together, and then the girls in the background are saying together, together, <laughs> and I'm screaming, ooh, ooey, baby, yeah. rhapsody. You know, I mean, it was like very, uh, it was a very sensual song. And th- these things were, I thought, what kids were talking about, but they didn't, in school, you know, like in 12th grade or something, you know, you say, oh, my God, I made, a, made out with Shirley or something this weekend, or we went to a party. I mean, that kind of a thing, I I started saying it. Um, and so uh, it got banned. And many of our things started getting banned. And that was banned. Then they made me go in and change the lyrics to it. Wow. We fell in love in the rain. How dare you? How dare you have sex on a record? I mean, you know. <laughs> Can you imagine that today? I mean, yeah, you yeah. know. I mean, what what they sang twenty years ago is past that, but that was banned. Time magazine wrote an article and said that I was corrupting the youth of the day. Oh my god, I was. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Not. Yeah, I know. It's just, uh, and so they made me go in and change the lyrics. The um, MGM Records said you got to change the lyrics, so I changed a couple of lyrics. Which it sounds just as bad. Or uh, yeah, instead of uh, we were making out in the rain, we fell in love in the rain, and in this car, I said our love went much too far. <laughs> so I changed it to our love came like a falling star. <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Oh my God!" And, and, but they put the record out, and it, and it was getting banned. But it, that's the one that started selling. Like, you know, we sold a million of the dirty ones. Yeah, right? of course. People were, there were only so, and that's the one that's worth the money because, I guess, because it was banned. You know. Yeah. Uh, but they made me go in and change the lyrics. But that's the one the kids wanted. Uh, but I, I, but but, I think I was stepping into adulthood or. Stepping into what life was right. You know, we wrote things that were what was going on in, in life. Yeah. You know, and I wasn't. I wasn't just uh, make you mine, baby. You know, I mean, I was. <laughs> I was saying things that were real. Yeah. Now, knowing you know. knowing that, of course, the music industry, everybody, you know, romanticizes it, but it is a business. Uh, tell us a little. Uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about your experience. If you had anything that was weird uh, or off-putting with Morris Levy and Roulette Records, because I'll oh. tell you, Lou, we've interviewed many people, including uh, Tommy James, and the stories of Roulette are infamous. Like they're mafiosos, according to Tommy James. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's put it this way. Tommy, when I read Tommy's book, I said, oh, that sounds like one of my chapters yeah. <laughs> in my book. I have been through so much in so many directions uh, with Morris. Because my first record, you know, I wrote two million selling records mm-hmm. and I had and sang them. Then I had two top 20 records and an album on top of it that was a uh, million. I didn't see a penny. Mm-hmm. Morris would tell you, yeah, don't worry, kid, don't worry, you know. 
<clears throat> he never he never paid me anything, nothing. So I I wrote those songs and sang them, and everything. And and then I I turned twenty one and I left, and I was threatened. All the same old bullshit, yeah. you know, that you hear from that Tommy went through. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Tommy, you know, stuck it out. I thought his book was good. I thought it was really great. But uh, you know, I was. We all went through something like that, uh, with, with especially with Morris. You know, because you know, and he still wanted to stick his name on the record yeah. as a writer. You know, he was just a pig. But he didn't uh, censor. He didn't censor your lyrics, though, right? Well, I wasn't with him uh, when I had Rhapsody in the Rain. Like that was. I switched at twenty. Then I went to MGM. No, I meant other lyrics. Like did, did he no, ever give no, me? no, no, no. He didn't even know. No, he yeah. loved my records. He had a good ear for. Uh, he had a good ear for forty-five or hit records. He yeah. knew a hit record, and I don't know if it was him or someone around him that liked it. You know, but I had. Uh, but I didn't. I did when I was signed to Roulette, I cut my record in Pittsburgh Mm -hmm. on a two-track machine, and then I went to a four-track machine, but I did it myself. We we did it uh, in Pittsburgh on a little local label called C&C, which was then distributed, uh, it was only local, and it started selling, and that's when they, the guys who were involved with me um, and let me go into the studio, they called Morris and said, we got a, a kid here uh, he's got a hit record here and is selling 9,000 records a week or something in Pittsburgh. And that's when Roulette picked up the record. Mm. And that's when I was signed with my first record, Gypsy Cried. It came from CNC or Cohen C, whatever they wanted, whatever they put on. Uh, and then it went to Roulette. And then I was stuck with Roulette for a couple of years because then I had Two Faces and the Gypsy Cried, How Many Teardrops, and You and I Have a Right to Cry, and the album. And that, and the uh, other, comp- but then he he never questioned because I was cutting the records with a guy in Pittsburgh, which was another odd level. Yeah, that I just don't not even used to going into. Because it, it was, uh, you know, we we came with when when I when we in Twilight and I wrote the songs, my uh, Shirley and Kay and Amy would do the backgrounds because we wrote the backgrounds at the piano when mm-hmm. we would write the song we didn't call an arranger and say write an arrangement for us <laughs> no we knew what we wanted right. before we would walk, we would even sing it for them so uh, the gypsy cried you know we, we wrote it the girls sang the background my sister Twilight's daughter Kay so they did the yeah yes and the yeah you know the harmonies with me and then Two Faces the same thing we did the album that way Anything we did with the girls, and and then and my sister, I sang sang more on most a lot of records, even in the seventies, like "Shake Hands and Walk Away Crying," um, uh, uh, just a lot of stuff. I think they're going to release some of the stuff from Columbia Records. I'm hearing about this. Oh, that'd now. be great. Recently, the things that were never released mm. that Twilight and I wrote, you know. And, and I and, and and I always had I always had the controversy of because uh, I was managed by Bob Marcucci, mm-hmm. who Bob Marcucci had managed Fabian and Frank Yavalon. Right. So when I went to Hollywood, Bob uh, uh, managed me. And that's when I I gave him lightning strike. That's why I cut the record in New York, and then I went out to Hollywood. But Bob and, and we all lived in the same house, but different times. Bob and Fabian and Frankie, when they moved out to Hollywood from South Philly, they lived in a Frank Lloyd Wright house. Well, I ended up living in the same house mm-hmm. as I went out in the '60s because he had lost he had lost uh, Bob, um, Frankie, and uh, Fabian. Uh, they had left him then at that point, so I was his new so-called person that he was hand, you know managing at that time. Right. And I lived in the uh, in, in the same house of all things. Isn't that weird? <laughs> well, there was there was probably leftover pizzas in the refrigerator. <laughs> and then, you know. Well, I could make my own. I didn't even let let <laughs> That's them. That's true. <laughs> I know. Isn't that weird? It was yeah. the weirdest thing of all. And well, I thought, oh my god! I remember going to a opening that night. I went one of the nights in Hollywood, and I was, you know, lying on, uh, by the pool. Excuse me, mm-hmm. by the pool, getting my suntan, 
because I was going to go see uh, the, I was going to be at the opening that night uh, for Tony Bennett oh. and uh, he was playing at the Coconut Grove and that was the night I met Natalie Wood and Warren Beatty. Oh wow. God! And, wow. as, and after, after, you know, seeing Slender in the Grass yeah. and all that stuff, and I thought, Oh my God! I mean, I was really living in Hollywood at that time, and and I was like, I, and I met. That was the night I met Judy Garland. Really? And Judy, Judy said, Oh, I love your. Record, <laughs> and I said, "What? <laughs> Why would you know my record?" <laughs> you know, Judy Garland. I said, "Oh, this is." Uh, I I couldn't even relate to it. I thought she was putting me on or something. You know. Yeah, she's and another whole her. era, and, and and she's she. I know. Likes but, rock and roll. <laughs> That's it, amazing. it really was. I I guess a lot of people were your fan. I guess one of your biggest fans was John Lennon. I know. I ne You never know who your fans are. <laughs> I have, yeah. He said, and and his girlfriend uh, May Pang, uh, who he had the affair with, you know, uh -huh. uh, May, May, and she. He used to call me Lightning Lou all the time, and I. I mean, I. I didn't know it, uh, but she. You know, she was with him for a couple of years, and she's a good friend of mine right now. Wow. Uh, so uh, I know it's it's amazing. You don't know who you touch. Yeah. You know, with well, your music or. I don't know the like you know, the way you smile, your your eyes. Well, it's not there. just he was a fan. He said that, that he was influenced by you. I mean, that that's pretty good. Yes, I, yeah, he he, I, he, you know, I find a, a lot of people that like listen to those records, and I have people that, you know, that I go into a restaurant and you know they they, they say, I was in one two weeks ago, and the guy said, he just stopped and said, I, I they put me I uh, I was there with. Some girl, we just sat down, and she, he said, "Are you Kim?" I said, <laughs> no, you, "You know." And this kid was like, I don't know, twenty-two or something. I I said, "I don't know who you, you know, are you the Lucristi or something?" I said, "Yes, uh, yeah." He says, I can't believe, and he he named off. I don't know how many records that he had of mine and told me about myself. I thought, well, you know more about me than I do. <laughs> <laughs> but it's amazing how you don't know. You know, right. you don't know what 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 vibe goes out or what happens. You know, uh, just uh, uh, well, it's like I, I'm a big fan of all those wonderful people too that in my past. You know, yeah. yeah. You know, whatever whether it was the McGuire sisters or whether it was. Kim Novak, or you know, some you know that kind of you know, or Peggy Lee. You know, I got to know Peggy Lee uh, pretty well. We, we all we all lived that. in a great era, Lou. I mean, we we had so many oh, great people. I, I feel sorry for the kids nowadays because they don't have all that history that we had. Because I'm around your age, they have no idea. Yeah, no idea. <laughs> they have no idea. Well, you know, we, the, I just. The, that kind of will will lead very well into the next question because uh, you, I've noticed that you're an excellent conversationalist. We get some people on interviews and they give two word answers. You're the <laughs> exact opposite of that, and it makes sense because I want to talk about your podcast, which I think has one of the best titles I've ever heard. It should have been a hit. Uh, tell our listeners a little bit about it. Oh well, isn't this a new one? Uh, well, yes, thank you. Uh, well, I, you know, I, I've always gone through my life, and and, uh, and every time I'm, I've been using my drummers have lasted about what ten years, twelve years with me, and every time I would get on a plane, I'd be singing something to say, "Where? Wh what's that song you're singing?" And I said, "Oh, it was by Brenda Holloway." I said it was never a hit, but it should have been a hit, and I kept saying this over these years, and I said, "Oh no, no, this was." Uh, it was the B side of Dionne Warwick's record. I said, "Oh, it, sh it really should have been the A side." You know, it should have been. And someone, you know, and they, and that's all I kept saying. They said, "You, I don't believe you know these songs." <laughs> I said, "I'm telling you, these are songs that I know that I loved, and I think they should have been a hit." And that's how it all started. Mm. And I, I have about a hundred songs on there now, uh, on the podcast. Uh, it's on SoundCloud, and then it's. Uh, uh, it should have been a hit dot com. So if you get on that, either one, it'll take you to either one, you know. And I just I, I talk about this record or about the person or why I think it's good or why I'm picking it or why it drove me crazy for thirty years. Mm -hmm. And I I play it and I think this 
was a, it should have been a hit by the Velvet Lead. Yeah. Why isn't this a hit? Or Robin Ward, when she did, uh, thank you for giving me the most wonderful summer of my life. Well, she had another record called In His Car. If you can listen to it on the podcast, you will hear it. It's just great. It's another, and I heard it one time in KDKA Pittsburgh in my hometown at about 2 o'clock in the morning. I was, I don't know why I heard it, and it was called In His Car by Robin Ward. I never forgot it. This is 35 years ago, 40 mm. years, 40 years ago. And, uh, and I put it on, and it's like, and it gets such reaction. The serious radio put it on. They said, "Oh, this song is so great," and then they got it from you know. And I and I've introduced them to a lot of my records, not well, mine, because they're not my songs. Right. They're just great records yeah. that should have been a hit. Well, you you like did the, some uh, Orbis songs. Sure, you did some hosting for Sirius XM too, right? I mean, you had that relationship. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. I just I just did uh, seriously Sinatra. Mm. Uh, I've done that a few times, uh, and I just did one for them, uh, which I really enjoy that because it takes me out of the, the rock and roll ball game, you know, yeah. and it puts me into into people like Nat King Cole or you know uh, I played a Frankie Valley record or a or a Diana Ross record, uh, you know, by herself from. Uh, do you know where you're going to? Or a Peggy Lee record, or 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 Joe 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 Stafford record? You know, and, yes. You know, but and I also, uh, you know, I host uh, sometimes on the '60s channel or '50s. You know, as, as a guest thing sometimes because they ask me sometimes to to do it, and I just love records so much that I'll I'll do it. You know. <laughs> so you would have been a disc jockey um, if you wouldn't have been a hit singer. So there you go. You. Good no, I don't know if I would have or not. I, I had no no desire to be a disc jockey at all. But I thought, you know, I don't know, it, it sort of worked in as as the record business faded itself out. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, because what there what is there is no record business anymore. No, right. No. And you that's, know, that's so, why it's good I mean, you're technology in, inclined, because like you're doing the podcast and everything. A lot of people from your era is like, what's a computer? You know, and, and it's easier when you yeah. you keep up with the well, times. Right? Well, I'm not, believe me, I'm not a whiz at it. <laughs> I am from that other generation. Yeah. And, uh, you, know, I, I, it, you know, when they say they're going to send me an MP3, and then they change the whole initial... I seem to be living with uh, syllables or something. I don't know what they are. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know what these things they're talking about half the time. But uh, I'm getting I'm getting through. <laughs> well, you you had I'm so many great collaborations. Like like you were singing with somebody who was supposed to be on our show, and, and she died, broke my heart so bad. Leslie Gore. What That's was she like? like? Yeah. yeah. Did you have a good relationship with oh, her? I mean, God. sweet girl, That's right? Funny one. She was very bright yeah very bright girl uh you know she was sharp as a tack she was raised uh, with a, a jazz influence she loved you know like uh dinah washington sarah vaughn the, the girl could sing no people really didn't realize she didn't have a powerful voice you're not talking about a whitney houston screamer you know that goes you know has the half minute to, to hit your top note leslie could sing um she was a natural singer, and she had a jazz flair to her, and she had an interpretation when she sang. If you think, uh, you know, when you hear her, anything she does live, she would do it different every night. It was what the band was feeding her. Yeah. You know, if a bass player was a better player, well, she would, I don't know, she would just backpedal and sing it different, uh, like the look of la- love or something, or... You know, so, uh, so many things that she and we we did a we did a lot of things together. We did the you know it should you know since I don't have you and it's only make believe, mm-hmm. and we used to close the, the concerts with that one, and that was just a major major people running to the front of the stage, you know, standing ovation kind of a thing. And we did things like Shaboom and Waterfalls Fall in Love. Wow. And we just a lot. We just worked all uh, you know, and it was great. And she was getting very. It made her a little nervous because we were turning into Steve and Edie, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and 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 that, and that sort of threw, that threw her, you know, because it was like, oh well, if you want, 
Steve, you got to take Edie, or if yeah, you want yeah. Edie, you, gotta, you know, put them two together, you know. Uh, there goes and a solo career. Yeah. yeah, it was uh, so. Uh, and then, of all things, I was, I was working, with, she called me probably a month before she passed away. Yeah. And said, we've got to do it again. This is ridiculous because that's the only time I ever made any money is when we would, we would pack them in Atlantic City or wherever we were working and doing shows together. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, she would call me out, I would call her out, we would work on different things together. So, I, she said, I said, she said, work on some things and I said, all right, I'm going to work on some things and you too. So we'll get together. I was sending her an email and my phone rang. Oh. And it was their manager and said, Leslie just died. Oh, God. It was... It broke my heart, I know. I, I know. It was, man, that was such a great loss. And, and I guess up until the, the day she died, she would <laughs> visit people in the hospital. I mean, that's where her heart was, you know? She yeah, had, she was a, she was a good, she was a good person. Yeah. But she was no fool. No. Nope. Yeah. She That's was for sharp. Sure. Uh, and she, she didn't, you know, she didn't put up with all the bullshit with a lot of these managers, agents, and that do yeah. to you, you know. Yeah. Uh, and you, you, you could, you couldn't intimidate her. Yeah. She was that sharp. Very smart person. I was impressed when you performed in the UK that uh, your piano player was Elton John. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, I wasn't aware. I really wasn't aware of it because the weird part about it, uh, I, I saw it on YouTube and people were telling me, oh, that's Elton. He's playing that. And I thought, oh my God, that was Elton John. But I didn't realize <laughs> it at the time because he wasn't Elton John then. He was right. <laughs> Reginald something, Reginald yeah, something. Yeah. right. And he recorded one of my records called "She Sold Me Magic," and he and if you go on YouTube, he's playing it the piano, and I'm singing it when I was in England on BBC uh, uh, network, and he uh, he ended up recording the song. He loved the song so much, and uh, um, and I came I came back from with a. a, a a few of his demos, his the records that he was writing, and I gave them to my record company, which was Buddha. Yeah. You know, I should write about this. I didn't even talk I talked about it, but I never write about it. Um, and I and and these songs, I thought this kid is a great writer. Listen to these songs he's going to do, and it was Elton John, and they turned it down. Wow. Ring, wow. You know, by the time we turned it down. But, you know, that happens. You know, they were they were into doing too much cocaine at the time. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, listening, listening to disco records, right. you know. Wow. Well, as we, as we wrap this up, I would be remiss if I did not ask about this book. Uh, when? Oh! Where? What, 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 what can you tell us about it? All I can say is I'm just... I'm just writing stories of things that happened along my life, um, and there. And it's not going to be one of those where you think, "Oh, this kind of gets so bloody boring." You know, I'm not going to rip everyone apart. Nothing like that. It's yeah. all, all as as um, Rose Kennedy said. I'd like to remember the good times. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm writing things that were just, you know, inspirational and things that turned me on. And things that I loved, uh, and 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 re and I I mean I hit reality too, you know I, I mean I do a uh, uh, few things about uh, one thing about Chuck Berry and that was interesting and uh, even Jimi Hendrix, you know uh, I mean I knew all a lot of these people even even when no one from my ilk, you know whether it was Brian Hyland or. Uh, you know, people that were in the pop field, because I continued on through that, and I lived in England for many years, three years, got married there, and have a couple children, and things like that, so England was a, 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 a different kind of a experience for me, you know, I've traveled the world, I lived in Hollywood for a few years, that was interesting, and you, you know, I lived you've in been, New York. You've been married since the 70s to the same woman, right? Yeah. Wow, that's yes. that's something right there. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's something. Yes. That don't happen anymore. <laughs> no, well, 
uh, I'm living in New York, and uh, my wife and my daughter are living in uh, right now in uh, Houston, Texas. So, mm -hmm. but that that uh, you know, and uh, you know, with this pandemic and the way things are going, you know, it's like, you know, you know, every once in a while I think, oh my God, maybe I should just get out of here, and go go back to England. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, where do I live next? Do I stay here? Do I not? You know, because yeah. now I'm. The, the the gig starting in September. I've got like a list of of concerts to do, and you know you're back on the track again. You think, oh my, are you ready for this? You know. <laughs> Except I wanted to ask you because I don't know, like, like there's so much politics in this pandemic thing, and whether to get inoculated or whether or not. And I assume you did. I don't know. Maybe you tell me. You know, but you made a, a statement on of Facebook. Of course and, I did. <laughs> okay, well, great. But you said on Facebook. That unfortunately you had some shows coming up that's been canceled because they knew not enough people has been inoculated. That's right, and that's sad. Now, you want to think? You want to think about that one? And, uh, and my last statement, I think today was, you don't even have to bend over. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> true. So you I know, guess your on, your you know, advice get, would be for people the, to get the shot, right? Well, you have to. Come on, this yeah. is. I don't know what that means. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't. I don't want to get into politics, yeah. but it is so bizarre that you would not, because the people who are dying yep. in New York, especially now, it's starting to go up, mm -hmm. are the people who are not vaccinated. Right. Yeah. And, and that's what's happening. And like in California, we didn't have to wear masks. Now we're on mandate to wear masks again because it's, it's surging. Well, I, I said today, I was at a restaurant, I said, you know what? I think I'm going to start wearing my mask again. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I just put it down two weeks ago, and everything was fine. And now it's starting to, you know, go up. And I thought, oh, my God, what the hell's going on? Because I, I, a year, I mean, I don't know how many times this has been, ch been changed. My concert schedule is just, you know, they, they just cancel. They have to. Yeah. You can't go in there and expect people to not to wear, you know, masks and not get shots and things like that. I mean, I have, I have about five in September and about five in October already mm -hmm. and now I can see them slipping away again yeah I mean I, I don't I, I mean I don't care because I want it to be right I don't have to get on the stage to you know that that sort of angst and anxiety I have to do it I have to do it no I I did it I, I did it for myself for whatever reasons you know that I that I became successful I did it and I don't have to. I don't have to kill myself or kill anyone else yeah. uh, to go out and do it again. You know, uh, and I really probably enjoy it more today than I ever have before me, because you learn who you are growing up, and you take different routes. You learn about who you are, what you like in life. And I thought this this year and a half was just. It really said an awful lot. It, you know, made you sit down and think mm -hmm. about who you are, what you yeah. are, and what you like, and what you want in life. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of satisfied, I think, with, you know, what I've come up with. You know, and I, I do, perf I love performing, and, um, and, and, and I want to do it the best, you know, or I don't want to do it. Right. Well, it's you just know. been a pleasure talking to you, because I'll tell you, you can understand how you've gotten through life and and the great hits you've had and and how everybody loves you because you've got soul and and you you're sincere and you're you're passionate and you're sensitive and i really like that about you i mean uh it, it's been oh thanks thanks thank you thank you thank you thank you and, for calling and and asking. talk to your friend frankie avalon you tell him we love him and we've been trying to get him on the show <laughs> forever i've had all of his philly pals except for frankie <laughs> just tell him we're a good really guy. yes yeah. <laughs> well, tell Frankie I have a picture of him, and I'm not going to release it. But uh, <laughs> unless he, unless he does your show. <laughs> but as a matter of fact, we're doing a show. Um, uh, where is it? it's next month? It, oh, I'm sorry, it's in September at Mohegan Sun. Mm. Mm. We're doing me and me and uh, Fabian and Frankie because yeah. I, I I do a, the Golden Boys sometimes, right. you know. Right. Uh, you know, but if if Bobby Rydell's not there or Fabian or whatever, but Frankie is just the ultimate pro at everything. 
He's great. Mm-hmm. Well, he was he he, so the big movie star. I mean, I loved all his beach movies. I loved the whole Annette thing and Frankie and. Oh, I do. Mean, uh, he's just great. Yeah. And he's such a pro. And he still, he still looks like an eight by ten glossy. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's because of that he rub. Does. He really does. It's because of that he rub really he does. sells that you put on your, your aching rub. muscles. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? yeah. You do whatever you want with it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> All, All right, right, so we'll, we'll be listening to your podcast. and then Yeah, we'll... so just as a reminder to uh, our listeners, check out Lou's podcast. You can head over to itshouldhavebeenahit.com yes. or over on yes, SoundCloud. I, I'm going through the whole summer I'm with disco music. So I've been putting on disco mixes uh, that a friend of mine has been doing. So the new one comes out uh, tomorrow. Awesome. Fantastic. And, and, you know, they're on there forever. Once they're on there, they're and, uh, on there. We but know. I, that's why. Because we want to live forever. That's why we do these shows and make uh, podcasts. Right. <laughs> exactly. It, it makes makes us kind of a star in a way. It's kind of nice. <laughs> but, but what about some of your country music? You did a country album. You're going to be doing some oh, of that? Oh, I've done some. Yes, I did some country. Oh, I. some of my best stuff was country that I, I did. My album uh, called The Turquoise Trail. I don't know if you know that. That album, uh, mm-hmm. it came uh, it's just really some wonderful stuff. Wow. Uh, if you gave me, uh, you know, you somehow send me your address, I'll send send you out a, a copy of it. I don't know if you have a player anymore. Oh yeah, oh no, <laughs> we had we have all formats, including eight tracks. So. <laughs> By the way, did you, you did you get what I sent out? I sent out a couple pictures and I things did. like that. Did you get them? I did. Yes, I did. Thank oh, you. Okay. All right. Good. I just didn't know if they are they arrived or not. But uh, I would, I'd love to send you out some of the stuff that uh, you know you might listen to. We we need to have you come out to the the studio, uh, live in Lake Hughes, California. You ever get out this way? And we got to have. Where, well, I'm I'll be out there for the uh, beginning of August. Where 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 is that uh, located? Uh, we're about I would say about forty minutes north of Hollywood. We're in actually in the Angeles National Forest. Up from Santa Clarita, if you know that. Oh, okay. Area. Yeah, we would love. Sure. To, Except we're going to have to make you make a pizza. you got to make pizza for us. <laughs> I can only make 100 pounds at a time. So that's, <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> well, thank you, Lou, and, and thank you to the lightning gods, because you are the lightning king that, that allowed you to do oh, this uh, despite the storm. So. Oh, well, thank you. It's great talking to both of you. Yeah. Thanks Absolutely. for calling me. Thank you so much, Lou. Have a great rest of your weekend. Thanks. All, All right. right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.